Okay. I have a couple of items of good news for the American people today to kick us off. Uh, today, the President will sign an extension of the Paycheck Protection Program, which passed both the House and Senate with wide bipartisan majorities. Since the beginning of the pandemic, 400,000 small businesses have closed for good and millions more are struggling to stay open. In December, Congress provided an additional uh, $284 billion for the Paycheck Protection Program. In just two months, we've approved over $200 billion worth of forgivable loans to more than 3 million small businesses. And in this round, we've distributed a greater share of relief to very small businesses. So today, the President will sign the Extension Act into law. We want small businesses to know that help is here, and they now have until May 31st to apply. Uh, as we do every week, um, Jeff Zients uh, hosted a call with governors uh, from across the country. Uh, he, of course, uh, provided them uh, an update on what the President announced yesterday, uh, that by April 19th, 90 percent of adults in the U.S. will be eligible for vaccination. 90 percent will have a vaccination site within five miles of where they will live. Uh, this will be made possible by increasing the federal retail pharmacy program from 17,000 to nearly 40,000 stores nationwide, a program that started out as a pilot and has been very successful. He also announced there will be an increase uh, of supply to over 33 million vaccine doses across all of our channels, which is going to help meet the needs uh, with the uh, moving forward of the eligibility timeline. Uh, another update um, in terms of uh, our getting the checks out to people. Uh, there have been, uh, there are a significant number of Social Security recipients who do not file taxes. As we noted earlier, uh, or a couple weeks ago, I should say, uh, direct payments went out very quickly to those who uh, file taxes every year, who do it via direct deposit. And thanks to collaboration between the IRS and the Social Security Administration, uh, they will soon announce that we are on track to send those payments uh, out this weekend. The majority of people should see them in the bank account in their bank accounts on Wednesday, April 7th, which is obviously a very positive step forward. Finally, as many of you saw earlier this morning, the President announced his historic slate of judicial nominees of his administration, the first historic slate, I should say, with 11 candidates overall. This is an unprecedented fast start for any president in the U.S. history on judicial nominations. This is also a groundbreaking slate in many ways. It includes four nominees who have served as public defenders, four who are members of the AAPI community, a nominee who, if confirmed, would be the first Muslim American federal judge in history. Nine of the 11 nominees are women. And overall, this uh, group represents a paradigm shift in the type of people who can see themselves on the federal bench while still maintaining the President's absolute highest standards for the qualifications, integrity, and fairness of each individual being considered. So lots of news. Go ahead. Kick us off. Thank you, Jen. Uh, I want to start by asking on guns. Um, it has been noted, actually, that 40 years ago today was the attempted assassination of President Reagan. Uh, but some gun safety groups have expressed disappointment at the President's sidestep of the issue in his news conference last week. Can you give an update on what is the, in the works in terms of a timetable for possible executive actions on guns? Well, first, let me say the President understands uh, their frustration. Uh, he is somebody who has fought for gun safety measures since he was in the Senate himself. Uh, he did that in his effort to fight for the Brady Bill, in his effort to fight for a, a ban on assault weapons, and in his leadership uh, getting putting in place almost two dozen executive actions um, on gun safety when he was in the Biden uh, Obama-Biden administration. Right now, we're working on a couple of levers. Uh, one is working with Congress. There are two background check bills that have moved their way through the House. Uh, many of you may have seen this weekend, Senator Chris Murphy, clearly a leader on these issues, somebody who has been a leader since uh, Newtown and even before, uh, has uh, sees a path forward. Uh, we've seen an openness uh, by even some Republicans to having a debate and a discussion. We'll take that. While that is moving, while there are discussions on that front, and the President will certainly be engaged in those, we are also continuing to review and consider what the options are for executive actions. Uh, we hope to have an update on that soon. I don't have an exact day for you at this point in time. Okay, a uh, follow-up on that and then one other matter. Uh, on the on guns, does the president still plan to go to Colorado after the mass shootings there? And if so, when? I don't have an update on a trip to Colorado. Obviously, that trip would be done in coordination uh, with the leaders in the state, community uh, in, that was impacted uh, by this te terrible tragedy, but I don't have uh, any plans to preview for a trip to Colorado okay. at this point. And then one more thing. On another lighter matter, uh, it's obviously a presidential tradition to throw out the first pitch on opening day. 
uh, which I'm happy to report is Thursday. Uh, but the Nationals have said that the president declined their invitation to go to this year. Why is that? Why is he not going? Is this about crowds in the park? Is it about sending wrong messaging? Why is he choosing not to be there on Thursday? Well, first, let me say, I know the president's eager to get out to National Stadium. Uh, many beautiful days, many beautiful baseball games ahead uh, this spring. It's not on his schedule uh, this week, but I certainly expect that baseball fans will be hearing from him uh, in, in, in the next couple days. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Uh, question about your infrastructure proposal being uh, released tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Is it going to focus more on shovel-ready projects that could get underway right away, or is it focused more on projects that might take a couple of years to get started but could ultimately have a bigger impact? It's a great question, and I expect we'll have more to outline on how quickly things can happen once he delivers the speech tomorrow. But let me just say that the speech tomorrow is about uh, making an investment in America. Uh, not just modernizing our roads, our railways, our bridges, but building an infrastructure of the future. So some of it is certainly infrastructure shovel-ready projects. Some of it is how do we expand broadband access. Some of it is ensuring that we are uh, addressing uh, the needs in people's homes and communities. So there are a range of components uh, that will be he'll talk about when he proposes his pa his uh, his ideas tomorrow uh, when he lays that out in his speech in Pittsburgh. And how much more should wealthy Americans expect to pay? Will the top marginal rate go back to 39.6% under this proposal? Well, I expect that um, tomorrow, again, the speech is really about his vision, his vision for creating jobs, good paying union jobs, and really investing in the industries of the future. But he thinks it's responsible, it's the responsible thing to do to propose a way to pay for that over time. So, uh, and he also believes that there's more that can be done to uh, make the corporate tax code fair. Uh, and so I expect that will be the focus of his uh, remarks on the on taxes tomorrow. And what about the estate tax? Is that something you're also considering increasing? Uh, again, I'm not going to get too far ahead of the president's own speech and proposal, and I know we'll be previewing it more in the next 24 hours, but he believes that there's more that can be done to make the corporate tax code fair, to reward work, not wealth, uh, to uh, ensure that we can invest in the future industries that are going to help all people in this country. And one other topic, 23 countries have signed on to the idea of this WHO treaty that would improve information sharing during future pandemics. Mm -hmm. Why hasn't the U.S. signed on to that? Well. We believe it's vital um, in uh, working uh, with international partners in other countries and, of course, strengthening and reforming um, our international efforts as it relates to addressing pandemics and future pandemics. Uh, we do have some concerns primarily about the timing um, and launching into negotiations for a new treaty right now, um, and we believe that could divert attention away from substantive issues uh, regarding uh, the response preparedness for future pandemic threats, and we believe that should be our focus currently, but we're certainly open to lo and looking for a continued col collaboration with the global community. Thank you. Go ahead. Does President Biden believe that the millions of Americans who lost loved ones to COVID-19 deserve a better response than one that they've gotten from the WHO? in terms of uh, looking in terms into- of origins for COVID-19. Well, I think he believes that the American people, the global community, uh, the medical experts, the doctors, all of the people who have been working to save lives, the families who have lost loved ones, all deserve greater transparency. They deserve better information. Uh, they deserve uh, steps that are taken by the global community to provide that. So there was an extensive statement put out um, by a number of countries, including the U.S., but let me highlight, a, we're, and we're still reviewing uh, the report, but let me highlight some of the concerns that have come up to date. Um, the report lacks crucial data, information, and access. It represents a partial and incomplete picture. Uh, there was a joint statement, as I noted, that was put out. We also welcome a similar statement from the EU and EU members, sending a clear message the global community shares these concerns. There are steps from here that we believe should be taken. There's a second stage in this process uh, that we believe should be led by international, international and independent experts. Uh, they should have uh, unfettered access to data. Uh, they should be able to uh, ask questions of people who are on the ground uh, at this point in time, and that's a step the WHO could take. And that statement says that uh, the U.S. joins these countries in expressing shared concerns. But the yeah. statement, quite frankly, is pretty uh, bureaucratic and um, perhaps does not meet the moment of the seriousness 
of the crisis here in this country in terms of the death toll. So what is the White House's actual reaction to this report from the WHO? Was it uh, simply inadequate? Well, the report uh, is we're still being reviewed uh, by our team of experts. 17 experts are reviewing it. But you know the headline of it, and it's not sufficient. Oh, we said, agree. So. And we have long said, as I just stated, it lacks crucial data, information. It lacks access. It lacks transparency. It certainly, we don't believe that in our review to date that it meets the moment, it meets the impact that this pandemic has had on the global community. And that's why we also have called for additional forward-looking steps. And I will tell you that negotiating between 20 countries or so to get a statement out, sometimes it, it appears bureaucratic. But well, the President I, speak on this? Um, on the WHO report? Uh, I expect we'll let our review conclude, and then we'll look for an opportunity for him to speak to it. But I can uh, certainly um, confirm for you that he shares these concerns. They, they are coming directly from him and directly from our national security team, who has looked at what uh, the report has presented to date. Uh, they're still reviewing and share the concerns issued in that statement uh, that made those uh, concerns clear. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. I just want to piggyback off of that as well. Uh, World Health Organization Director General uh, Tedros, one of his primary concerns was that the report may have glossed over, if you will, uh, the, the possibility that the, the, that the virus escaped from a lab. <laughs> Is that a central concern of the White House as well? And then when you, when you talk about cooperation, has, has China not cooperated enough in, in the White House's opinion? Well, they have not been transparent. They have not provided underlying data. That certainly doesn't qualify as, as cooperation. Uh, you know, the analysis performed to date from our experts, uh, you know, are, their concern is that there isn't additional support for one hypothesis. It doesn't lead us to any closer of an understanding or greater knowledge than we had six to nine months ago about the origin. It also doesn't provide us guidelines or, uh, or steps, uh, recommended steps, on how we should prevent this from happening in the future. And those are imperative. And so that centers on the, the, the hypothesis that, that would involve the lab. Uh, again, it doesn't, it doesn't lead to, uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't provide us greater uh, understanding uh, of uh, the origin uh, of, of the virus. And, and the second question, just on, on the next legislative package, um, has the president started to reach out to, to moderates, to uh, centrist Republicans as well, and to, to kind of woo them to get ahead of uh, you know some of the, the things that we saw with the, the last package? Woo them. Yes. I like it. Um, you know, the president uh, will be, of course, directly engaged um, in, um, in this effort to move this package forward. Uh, I will say that what he views his role uh, is as is um, laying out what a vision is, uh, a broad vision, a bold vision for how we can invest in America, American workers, our communities. Uh, we're also, though, uh, very open to hearing ideas and proposals from members of Congress, Democrats or Republicans. We know that 80 percent or more of people in this country Democrats and Republicans support investing in infrastructure. And of course they will. Of course they do. We're 13th in the world um, uh, as it relates to infrastructure. We're the, one of the wealthiest countries in the world. That doesn't make a lot of sense to most people across the country. More than one third of bridges in this country need repair. That's 231,000. That's a lot of bridges. Uh, one in five miles or 886,000 miles of our highways and major roads are in poor conditions. Those aren't issues where Democrats just have concerns. Republicans have concerns, independents, people who don't see themselves as political. And he believes that investing, we can't afford not to invest in improving our infrastructure. There are questions about, people have, may have different ideas about how to pay for it. We're open to hearing them. So hopefully people will bring forward ideas. And last question. Uh, the skinny budget is due out this week. What programs or agencies should we expect to see a boost in funding? I know people love the term skinny budget, but is actually just a discretionary uh, guide. Um, so uh, it should be out soon and we'll wait for it to come out and then I'm sure we'll have an update from our uh, budget, uh, our OMB team. Go ahead, Kristen. Thank you, Jen. Uh, could you provide a bit more insight into why the White House has felt the need over the last few days to really clarify the Vice President's role at the border? Was that something that she uh, requested a clarification on? I actually think that members of the media deserve to have an understanding of what her exact role was. And the president, when he was the vice president, played a very specific role, too, where he uh, was running point on the Northern Triangle. He tell, told the story at the press conference last week about how the president called him back from Turkey, I think it was. And he wants the vice president to play a similar, similar role and engaging with these countries, engaging with their leaders, figuring out how to invest best, how to work in partnership, how to prevent corruption from taking over, to put in place steps that will uh, 
make the journey less desirable, uh, that is certainly a big assignment and one the president is confident the vice president will take on so, so and do well. So is the plan always for her to focus on the Northern Triangle countries, the root causes, as opposed to the border, or did something change? That was always the uh, plan, and that was the announcement. Okay. Uh, I'd like to find out what the White House thinks about what's happening in San Diego, mm -hmm. where some public school teachers are providing in-person instruction at the San Diego Convention Center to migrant children before their own public school students, and these kids, of course, about 130,000 of them, have been at home doing online learning for about a year now. So what does the White House think about that? Well, I know you guys have done a fair amount of reporting on this, so maybe you'll have more details. Uh, as I understand it, San Diego Public Schools are opening in early April. April 12th to hybrid learning. Okay. And students will be back in the classroom. And as I understand it, this is related part-time. Uh, and certainly, you know our objective from the White House, opening up five days a week, uh, majority of schools across the country. And uh, they're on spring break right now. And this is related to volunteering or being paid. I'm not even sure you'd have to ask the local school district during spring break for these migrant kids. Yes, yeah, so the San Diego County Supervisor, Jim Desmond, he says, you know, I think it's great that there's in-person learning for unaccompanied minors from Central America, but I wish every child in San Diego County was allowed the same opportunity for in-person teaching. So I guess the, the question is, you know, uh, does the White House think that this sends the right message to these 130,000 kids in San Diego and their parents who've been stuck at home for the last year? Well, I'm just saying that context is important. And these kids are going back to school uh, for hybrid learning. We, of course, want that to be five days a week, and we're confident we'll get there early next month. And I believe they're also on spring break right now. So these teachers are would be, I'm not sure if it's volunteer or paid. You'd have to ask the local school district um, while the kids are on spring break, which I think the context is pretty important. Okay, okay, and I've got one oh, go more ahead. question, sorry, about space. Go ahead. Uh, you know, the Biden administration, they just announced its intention to retain the National Space Council, and this is on top of the White mm -hmm. House voicing its support for the Space Force, yes. NASA's Artemis program. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are three programs or policies that President Trump and the Trump administration put in place. So would it be fair to say that space is one of the, and space policy is one of the few areas where President Biden actually agrees with his predecessor? I think that that sounds accurate to me. Uh, look, I think the president believes that um, the National Space Council, as as you uh, as you just conveyed or just asked about, uh, provides uh, an opportunity to generate national space policy strategies, synchronize on America's space activities at a time of unprecedented activity. It's also an opportunity um, to gen generate by America's own activities in space. So uh, it certainly is a program uh, or a council, I should say. He's excited to uh, keep in place, and one uh, I think it's fair to say he agrees uh, with the past administrations uh, maintaining the program. Go ahead in the back. Uh, the White House has been talking about a lot of different types of infrastructure over the last few weeks leading up to the announcement tomorrow. Can you give us a sense of what the general breakdown is going to be on you know, clean energy and climate type projects versus roads and bridges? I know we will have an extensive fact sheet that will break down everything for you. It is quite, quite long. Uh, it is quite long. Uh, and I, I don't want to get too far ahead of the president. But I will. Let me, let me see if I can give you a little bit more of a, of a breakdown, not in terms of the numbers. But um, so certainly investing in, we've talked about this a little bit, roads, rails, and bridges is part of it. The president believes that we can do that in a way where we can create uh, good paying, clean energy jobs, union jobs. Uh, that's part of his vision for investing in industries of the future. Uh, he also believes there's more we can do on broadband um, and ensuring that the far too large percentage of the American people who don't have access uh, have access, and we invest in that. Uh, there's a lot of ways to do that, I will say, though, and he's very open to the ideas coming from Congress on how to do it. And they may have different perspectives on how to do it, the right way to invest uh, and to do it. Um, but he sees um, you know, a, a clean energy and clean energy jobs as central to his uh, own vision and his own objectives. You'll certainly hear him talk about that tomorrow. And uh, this is, uh, but the speech is, is really about, um, it's about jobs. It's about investing in the industries of the future. Uh, and it's about uh, rebuilding parts of our communities that have uh, long been uh, forgotten. And does the White House have a response to this uh, this new Chinese law finalized uh, earlier today that uh, essentially allows them to vet parliamentary candidates in Hong Kong for so-called non-patriots to not be allowed to run for office? 
I know we have certainly expressed concerns about the undemocratic steps of the Chinese government in the past. I'll have to check with our national security team. I had not asked them about this specific piece, but we will get back to you uh, shortly after the briefing. Go ahead, Chris. Um, so Chuck Schumer is urging people to write and email the president, the White House, in hopes uh, that he will cancel up to $50,000 of student loan debt. Why do you think that Schumer has such a fundamentally different reading of what the president can and should do. And if you could answer yes or no, um, is this, has the president ruled out taking unilateral action on this yet? Uh, no, he has not. Uh, I will say that uh, I do have some good student loan news for you, which you didn't even know you were going to tee up for me. But um, we will be expanding the pause on student loan interest and collections to the more than 1 million borrowers who are in default on a loan that was made by a private lender in the old bank-based ba loan program known as the Federal Family Education Loan Program. This step particularly protects 800,000 borrowers who are at risk of having their tax refunds seized. That's actually a pretty significant uh, step. The President continues to call on Congress to cancel $10,000 in debt for student loan borrowers. That's something Congress uh, could take an action on and he'd be happy to sign. We're still taking a closer look at our, our options on student loans. This includes examining the authorities we have, the existing loan forgiveness programs that are clearly not working as well as they should. This includes borrower defense, total and permanent disability charges. There's a lot of steps we're looking at, and we'll continue to review those and be in touch, of course, with Leader Schumer about uh, our process. Do you have a sense of the timing on that, how long those reviews might take? I don't have an, uh, an update on the, on the timing. There's a legal and a policy review. Uh, go ahead. Oh, Trevor, did you have a question? I, I did. didn't mean yes. to skate. Go, I, go ahead. I always have a question. Of um, course. <laughs> so uh, first, just on the, the infrastructure questions that we were talking about, yeah. you said yesterday that there would be a dollar for dollar accounting of how um, the measures would be paid for. Yep, paid uh, for over time. Yep. Paid for over time. Mm -hmm. Is is the president willing to sign a bill that does not pay dollar for dollar for all of the proposals that he has? Well, the president believes it's responsible to propose a way for paying over time for uh, his vision for investing in infrastructure and, uh, and our economy and American workers. Uh, there will be a range of views, uh, including how to pay for it. People will be for or against. Some people may not want to pay for it. Um, and he's open to having those discussions. So, but the, 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 th the focus of his speech, of his proposal, is on investing in America. We're talking about um, tax uh, reform proposals that uh, would help uh, pay for it over time. But the reason he is putting those forward is because he thinks it's responsible to put forward a plan to pay for it um, as, a, as a means of discussing that. But it's really about investing in workers. But he is open to deficit financing in a final package. Uh, again, I think we haven't even proposed the speech yet. Uh, there will be a range of views on Capitol Hill, as we all certainly know. He's proposing a way to pay for his proposals over time. We'll look forward to hearing from members of Congress on how they want to approach it, given there's such strong support for infrastructure investment across the country. Okay, and just on a quick one on foreign policy. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Iran has come out uh, and basically already rejected a proposal that you haven't even put on the table yet. Um, about uh, rela relaxing some of the sanctions against them uh, to get them to come to the table. They say all of the sanctions need to be relaxed before they'll consider any changes on uh, uh, enrichment. Uh, is there any point to putting a proposal on the table if it's, if it's already going to be a non-starter? Well, we remain committed to pursuing a diplomatic process to determine a way forward. Sometimes that takes some time, uh, and we certainly have found that in the past as it relates to negotiations uh, with Iran. Um, we remain ready to re-engage in meaningful diplomacy to achieve a mutual return to compliance with the JCPOA commitments. Uh, and that offer to discuss and engage is on the table. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. One quick follow-up on space and then two others. Sure. So Vice President Pence had a pretty public-facing role with the National Space Council. Mm -hmm. He was kind of involved in the policy making. I know it's a, a new new thing here, but will Vice President Harris have a similar involvement with the Space Council on her end? Uh, it's a great question. I, I know it's a, the Space Council technically falls under the Vice President's team and office. Um, I'd have to talk to her team about her public-facing role, and I'm happy to do that. Gotcha. One well, on ambassadors. So there is yet to be an employment for the U.S. ambassador to China. There's mm -hmm. been some reporting that there's rumors about kind of jockeying of who that person might yeah. be. Any updates on the uh, appointment time, timeline, even a short list for, for that posting? 
I know I've seen a lot of names reported out there, um, some of which would be great choices. Uh, but I uh, don't have an update uh, on the timeline for uh, announcing the nomination of ambassadors. For the summertime, anything broad? Certainly hope so. Uh, but uh, I don't have an update on, on when the president will make any decisions. Great. One quick one on the Supreme Court. So okay. about a year ago, I would say, President Biden, then candidate Biden, committed to putting a black woman on the Supreme Court. Of course, today's um, appointments and news kind of generate some buzz on who those folks might be. Mm -hmm. Is there any update, anything you can advance for us on uh, Vice President Biden's efforts to put a black person in the Supreme Court, any kind of short list situation to that end? It would require there being an opening on the Supreme Court, of course. There is not an opening on the Supreme Court. Uh, Look, I think there uh, is an incredible group of um, nominees the president announced today. Um, you know, as someone who uh, served for 17 years on the Senate Judiciary uh, Committee as chairman and ranking member, he has a long history on judicial appointments. This is a priority uh, for him. Uh, but our focus is on getting uh, the Senate to confirm these group of nominees and to continue to build a, a pipeline of additional highly qualified uh, nominees who are going to reflect uh, the values the president has outlined. That commitments on the table? Of course, to, to nominate an African American woman to the Supreme Court? Yes, absolutely. It certainly is. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yes, one more follow up on the WHO. Is the president disappointed with the WHO? Does he believe they're not up to the task? I think what the statement makes clear is that we remain, that uh, that was issued by the State Department today, is that we remain confident in uh, the role of the WHO. We uh, look to be a contributing member of the WHO. Uh, we have some concerns, as, we, as I've expressed, about uh, the analysis that's been done so far about the report, and we think that steps can be taken moving forward in the second stage of the review uh, to ameliorate some of those. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Jen. Uh, I wanted to ask a few questions. Uh, first, I wanted to follow up on something President Biden said Wednesday when he was tasking Vice President Harris with managing root causes of the border crisis. Uh, he said uh, that uh, in addition to doing that, she has, quote, about five other major things she's handling. Uh, could you clarify what those are? Well, first, uh, some of it is uh, is we have not yet announced yet, so I won't get ahead of those. Um, Vice President Harris is playing an imperative role uh, out there, connecting with the American people about the American Rescue Plan. She's been traveling across the country. She's done a number of trips and taken steps. She's going to be involved in uh, our effort to communicate with the public about uh, COVID and the importance of the effectiveness and efficiency of the vaccine. Uh, and we'll have more to say soon. And a quick follow-up on the uh, question I asked last week about the White House and the marijuana policy uh, policy that impacted some fired staffers. Uh, you, you indicated that things might be different if marijuana was federally legal. And actually, uh, the Democrats in the Senate, led by Majority Leader Chuck Schumer, are preparing a uh, bill to end federal prohibition of marijuana. Uh, does President Biden support that? He spoke about this on the campaign. He believes in decriminalizing the use of marijuana, but his position has not changed. Descheduling then, federal descheduling, and end the federal prohibition? That's been his position. Nothing has changed. And uh, regarding uh, the WHO, former President Trump accused the WHO of being, quote, a puppet of China. Uh, does this report confirm that claim? Well, I think we've expressed our concerns about uh, the role, uh, the lack of transparency, the lack of data that has been provided broadly to the global community. We believe there are steps that can be taken moving forward to ensure that an independent investigation, that uh, global experts are involved in the next stage of this process. Uh, but we also believe that the WHO is a body that the United States should be a part of, that in order to make changes happen, we need to have a seat at the table. And that's why we rejoined the WHO. Go ahead in the back. Thank you very much, Jen. Uh, I have one question on Asia and one question on Asian Americans. Uh, we know that Japanese Prime Minister is coming to visit, and also both NSC and State Department are set to uh, host the, uh, their Japanese and South Korean counterparts. Uh, as the representative of the Foreign Press Group, I got a question from NHK. Uh, the Japanese media ask, your administration has focused on working closely with East Asian allies like Japan and South Korea to counter China, but these countries have a different relationship with China than the U.S. has with China. So how will you have your Asian allies cooperate with you when they sit on different interests than the U.S.? I'm not sure I completely understand your question. Are you asking if we, how will we discuss China and our relationship with China when the president and others in the administration see leaders from Japan? No, I, I, the, 
East Asian countries have different interests uh, than the U.S. has with China. Sure. So how will how will you uh, have your Asian allies cooperate with you if they, you have different interests? Well, I think uh, just like the U.S. relationships with any country. There are areas of mutual interest. There are areas where we can uh, communicate, work together on, even sometimes have disagreements, whether it is uh, economic cooperation or security in the region. Uh, and certainly, will I expect that those conversations to cover a range of topics. OK, on um, um, Asian American uh, question, we just saw the fact sheet that you uh, uh, released uh, yep. earlier. But it does not address the demand from AAPI communities uh, for uh, more representation uh, on uh, leadership levels. Uh, what's more concerning, uh, during yesterday's interview, Senator uh, Tammy Duckworth uh, said uh, she, uh, she asked, she's pushing for this representation, and the White House uh, said to her, quote, you have Kamala, you don't really need any other Asians in the cabinet. And the Duck Wars said, quote, that is really offensive. You wouldn't say we have white male president. There shouldn't be any white male members of cabinet. Why would you say that to someone from the Asian community, end quote? What is your reaction to her uh, statement? Well, first, we've had a range of conversations with Senator Duckworth since that call, which happened about a week ago, um, including a commitment to uh, naming a high-level uh, Asian American member of the AAPI community uh, to a position in the White House. And that's something we're uh, working to do through consultation with a range of officials and elected officials as well. And that person will be a commissioned officer and will be uh, working on both policy and outreach. And as soon as we have a name, we will share that with all of you. But a big part of um, our effort has also been on taking actions uh, to uh, address the rise in anti-Asian violence and bias and underscoring the commitment uh, of our entire administration to working in partnership with the AI. AAPI community. Uh, we announced, the President announced that DOJ has launched an agency-wide initiative to address anti-Asian hate crimes and acts of violence. DOJ is taking steps to strengthen hate crimes data, reporting on AAPI violence, improve law enforcement training so that local law enforcement agencies can better identify anti-Asian bias. In the coming weeks, the administration will meet with AAPI leaders to hear their input uh, and how we can play the most constructive role possible in the community. And the President raised um, um, because he felt it was imperative to elevate the uh, continuing threats, the hate speech, and the violence against the Asian American community in his uh, speech he gave during a primetime address a week ago. Go ahead. Yeah, I, uh, I t actually a good follow up from sure. what Ching Yi just asked. So thank you, Jen. Sure. Um, so as you know, we've had a spike in carjackings in Washington, D.C. Yeah. And there's been a huge uproar, of course, about the carjacking and killing of a Pakistani American mm -hmm. by two teenage girls. Uh, does the president? plan any outreach to the AAPI community of Washington given, given this uproar? Well, the President uh, and his administration, he's asked uh, members of his team, senior levels of his team, to be engaged in a broad swath of leaders from the AAPI community from across the country. I can certainly sec check if there will be individuals from the D.C. community as a part of that outreach. Okay. And given that there's been this spike in carjackings here in Washington, has the White House put any gu out any guidance to to staff who, of course, work in Washington, many live in Washington. Has there been anything on that? I, I think we would uh, certainly defer to local law enforcement and, and guidance along those lines. I'm not aware of any additional guidance being put out. Let me just go around to make sure I get to everybody. Go ahead in the back. Yeah, well, during his press conference last week, the president was very stern and expressive when it came to expressing his opinion about the so-called voter suppression laws in Georgia and elsewhere. But what tangible action will the president take to turn that tide, particularly when you're talking about a federal bill facing an uphill, uphill climb in the Senate? Well, there's a, a number of actions. One, I wouldn't call it so-called bias, because we know that in communities across Georgia, there have been polling places that have been closed. Those are in predominantly African-American communities, so I think that is real bias. Um, second, I would say that we don't see these. Uh, we certainly know there's an uphill battle for lots of legislation, but we are encouraged by the conversations that are happening about moving uh, legislation forward to make voting more accessible, uh, more available, 
available to people across the country. The president believes it should be easier, not harder to vote, and he will look for opportunities to help push that legislation forward. He also signed a number of executive orders just a couple of weeks ago because he believes that uh, you know, this is a central cause and equity uh, issue in his mind, and he wants to take uh, take steps from, from the White House, steps any president can take to also make voting uh, more accessible. But we also need to continue to work with local leaders. He met with Stacey Abrams when he was in Georgia just a couple weeks ago. A lot of the power and the activism is going to come from the grassroots and incredible leaders like Stacey Abrams who are ensuring people have the facts they need, um, the information they need to vote, and that they push back against oppressive uh, efforts to, to uh, make voting more difficult. How is the White House engaging the faith community when it comes to gun control? Uh, well, m many members of the faith community have been quite outspoken historically about um, about uh, the threats of gun violence that have impacted communities across the country. Certainly that would come from our Office of Public Engagement, uh, who would lead these efforts to outreach to a range of communities. Uh, I can check with them and see if there's any specific meetings with the faith, with faith groups um, in recent days. And lastly, oh, is it... Yeah, is there anything to be read into sort of the rebranding of the Biden administration to the Biden and Harris administration? Is uh, it a rebranding? Well, when you when you look on the website, it's you know it's, not, it's it's Biden Harris, and that's not been uh, necessarily the norm of the past. Is there any message being sent by that, or what's meant to be? Uh, what can be extrapolated from I that? would take from it that Vice President Harris is an important partner. She's the first in the room, the last in the room on most occasions. If she's in town and not traveling around the country. Um, it's a reflection of the important role uh, that she will play moving forward. Go ahead. And speaking with uh, several governor's offices that were on the call with the White House mm -hmm. this morning, it's come to our attention that there were um, not a lot of questions or really any questions or pushback on um, the comments yesterday from both the president and Dr. Walensky, you know, advising state and local governments against rolling back. Uh, mask mandates. Just given the fact that there were no questions or really any uh, dialogue, at least according to our reporting right now, what is the level of concern from the White House at uh, the effect 24 hours after the president raising his voice on this? Dr. Walensky is certainly raising her voice on this. I mean, are governors uh, sort of going their own way and ignoring you all? I don't think we see it that way, Jeff, but I would say that uh, one of the ways we can impact um, people across the country is by acknowledging this is hard. We've been at war with this virus for a long time. And to reiterate, as the president did yesterday, as Dr. Walensky did yesterday, that we continue to be at war with the virus. But the way we feel we can be most impactful is not just through words, but is through actions. And so as we have seen um, in uptick, we've also taken an accelerating threat, I should say. We've also accelerated our response. And we've moved up universal shot date for most Americans by two weeks, increased vaccine supply to states, doubled the number of pharmacies getting supply, more than doubled, opened more vac mass vaccination centers. We know that the more people who can get vaccinated, the more accessible it is, the more effective uh, we are going to be, and that's where we're putting our efforts. Is there enough concern from governors uh, based on the call this morning, do you believe? I was not on the call this morning. I think the president's speaking not just to governors, but to people across the country, to business owners, to local elected officials. There are even in some states where governors have been pulling back the restrictions, there are local leaders and local businesses or bigger businesses who have kept them in place. And it's important for people, it's a tough message, important for people to hear that we're still uh, in a war with this virus and people need to still be vigilant in order to return to normal. Go ahead. Thanks, Jen. Today, Canada halted delivery of the AstraZeneca vaccine. What does that mean for this administration's posture towards that particular vaccine and the vaccine's prospects of approval here in the U.S.? Well, approval would, of course, be through the FDA, and they have a rigorous and thorough process uh, for doing that. So I will leave that to them to undergo that, that process, and I don't have anything to predict about the approval likelihood. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Want to go one more? Sure, one more vaccine okay. question. Okay. I mean, given the increased urgency and the fact that millions of Johnson & Johnson vaccines are on the near-term horizon, yeah. is the White House considering changing the way it deploys those vaccines since those kick in so much quicker than the other vaccines? The Johnson & Johnson vaccines? Yeah. Sticking to the same per capita distribution, or is there any thought about changing the way those are distributed? 
Well, we uh, we think a lot about how to ensure vaccines are distributed equitably across the country. Um, but our message continues to be: you should take any vaccine that is available to you. There are three approved. They're all safe. They're all effective. So we're not changing our approach at this point. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.